Dennis McNeil, please come forward. Dennis has a background in uh, the Air Force. Uh, he has experience in wind drills. He owns a high performance, a lovely aircraft, which has a, an unusual performance. And um, he's going to tell you, I don't have to introduce him because you're going to find him introducing and tell you his background because uh, you're going to pick it up as he goes along. And uh, he's got a, a fair bit of background there. So, Dennis, it's all over to you. Thanks, Brian. The Windjill story, uh, in many ways, parallels my own story. It's the first aeroplane I've ever flown in, and or flown. And I'm happy to say I'm still flying them today. So we go back many years. Um, so uh, a brief history of the aeroplane, and I'll inject some of my own experiences with it. Uh, I have experience in the Windjill both as a tradesperson and as a pilot both student and flying instructor, as well as just having lots of fun. The history started way back in 1948, when the RAF uh, decided that uh, they wanted to combine training that was currently being done by both the Tiger Moth and the Wirraway into one aircraft. At that stage, uh, student pilots in the military were doing about 60 hours on the Tiger Moth and 60 hours on the Wirraway. So following that, uh, in 1949, CAC uh, did their homework, came up with some concepts uh, that fulfilled the description of the requirement, and they were given the order and approval to build two prototype aircraft. They were also given the approval to build uh, two prototype engines, and uh, I'll just mention that in passing in a short while. Um, on January the 26th, 1951, some two years later, the uh, first prototype uh, was uh, ready to roll out and fly. It was uh, at that stage designated type CA-22, whereas the production model was subsequently designated CA-23. It was also given the constructor's number of 1426. At that stage, CAC used to number each aircraft it made, with number one being a Wirraway, through to 1426, the first wind yield. Uh, that's what it looked like. And if you, in particular, take note of the tail area, which you'll find uh, was subject to quite a lot of development, for those who haven't heard before. Uh, the prototype engine was cancelled in the same year. Uh, it was uh, named the Cicada. It was to, they actually built two, but they only did 600 hours total running time. Uh, it was uh, actually uh, one row of the R1830 engine, which uh, CAC were building under licence. It was 100 pounds heavier than the uh, Pratt & Whitney that they subsequently ended up with, and needed 2600 RPM to develop 450 horsepower. Uh, so um, they decided that wasn't the way to go because of the extra wear, fuel consumption, etc. The second prototype uh, rolled out uh, six months later. Uh, it was the next aircraft that they built because uh, it was fairly quiet at CAC at that time uh, after the wind down of uh, World War II production. It looked very similar, um, although there were some minor differences. Uh, can anybody see anything unusual in this picture? You'll have to have pretty good eyesight. Tailwheels. Yes, you're absolutely right. Have a look at the tailwheel over there. Uh, there's another picture there which shows that it a little bit better. Um, this is an interesting sideline of the windshield, which uh, was designed with a tail that could fully cast out or be locked in place and then uh, slave to the rudder, which gave it a very good uh, control for uh, taxiing in strong winds, but was also extremely manoeuvrable with some expertise and could almost turn in the same length. However, uh, landing with it in this current mode was quite exciting to say the least <laughs> and uh, many many a student and the odd staff member uh, did uh, ground loop uh, spectacularly uh, not realizing that the tail wheel was unlocked and the stability a locked tail were provided was all gone <laughs> okay during this time there's quite a lot of test and development went on and uh, one of the things that was discovered was that the rudder was far too light and it actually, near full deflection, stalled and had virtually no effect at all. The other controls were very well harmonised and balanced. 
Um, the aircraft was very reluctant to spin, and I, I, I'm sure most of you have heard about the unspinnable windshield and the modifications they made. Um, it actually uh, had spin recovery and spin and recovery characteristics that were described as not classic. And by classic, they meant uh, it had to stall when you pull the stick full back and put it in full rudder. Um, and uh, also would rotate nice and smoothly uh, in a stable situation and recover with uh, opposite rudder. More on that later. The solutions, uh, there were many of them, but I've selected uh, the main ones here. The engine was moved forward uh, several inches. The tail, fin and rudder were lengthened vertically and they were also moved well forward in addition. There's all, uh, another major mod which I haven't listed there was the wing fillets were extended significantly and uh, if you look at these two pictures here um, you'll particularly notice that uh, it, there's the original and here's the subsequent one. Um, also in, oh have a look at the wing fillets how big a difference there are. Also in this picture you'll see the original uh, spin recovery parachute uh, in the uh, dorsal position and subsequently it was located here where previously the rudder had been. There's a colour picture which also shows the amount of flap the wind yield has. It has an extraordinary area of flap. It has simple flaps uh, on the wings and has a split flap under the uh, uh, under the fuselage and the uh, stub wings. Uh, it goes down uh, some 50 degrees and uh, reduces the stall speed by uh, close to 10 knots but also increases the drag enormously so it allows for very short landings. Here's another uh, picture of the uh, change of configuration. You'll notice the prototypes also had the letter P on them. I'm not sure why, maybe the pilots uh, didn't realise that they were prototypes and would have treated them differently. <laughs> um, this picture totally unposed, uh, quite a candid shot. Uh, you can see uh, Sir Lawrence Wackett, the uh, chairman of uh, uh, CAC, wearing the hat, and the designer of the Wingeal, uh, I think his name was Ian Ring, uh, uh, pointing out uh, various things to uh, Sir Lawrence and uh, somebody else who mm -hmm. also put his finger in. There was a lot of structural testing went on on this aeroplane too. Uh, uh, CAC did an enormous job. Here's uh, some jigs uh, set up to test the wing structural integrity. <coughs> Additionally, uh, this, this is quite an interesting shot if you have a closer look. This is the canopy being tested and these uh, pressure devices here are sometimes known as uh, air pumps. The old fashioned pumps that you used to pump up your T model Ford tyres with when they went flat. Um, I can only imagine uh, trying to synchronise all of those things with half the staff of CAC pumping it up to make sure it uh, accepted pressure. I've no idea why they did that because it wasn't pressurised anyway. Uh, but um, one interesting thing I did uh, discover, they also did uh, canopy jettison trials on the windshield. And I, while I think of it, the, the aircraft at this stage was not called a windshield, it was simply called a basic trainer. The uh, Aboriginal word meaning young eagle only came into being somewhere late in 1953. But the, uh, back to the canopy jettison, they decided yes they would try it, but in true Australian fashion uh, they decided they didn't want to break any canopies. So they uh, managed to procure a couple of cranes from down on the docks somewhere and a big net. They got hold of a Lincoln and they parked it in front of the windshield, ran up the engines until the guy in the windshield saw 80 knots on the airspeed indicator. Then I guess he leaned as low as he possibly could and pulled the jettison handle. <laughs> so so there, there's a canopy actually on its way back. <laughs> And they did many of these trials uh, until eventually, uh, sadly, one of these cranes uh, crept forward a little bit. The net sagged and they, they terminated their project when uh, the canopy went over the top of the net. <laughs>
Okay, <laughs> continuing the history. Uh, in 1951, the RAF ordered 62 production aircraft. Now, interestingly enough, although the RAF ordered them, the government didn't approve them. And that took somewhat longer. And you can see there's quite a long gestation period here. We've already uh, run three years and uh, not a great deal has happened except they've uh, got the aeroplane uh, uh, pretty much to a suitable stage to uh, go into production. And in 1954, another three years later, uh, production commenced. Uh, part of the delay was uh, the RAF needed further modifications uh, to uh, reach its own requirements, although some of them never were reached. For example, they, they wanted an aircraft that uh, could climb at a thousand feet a minute, and somehow that is in the description of the wind yield that it climbs at a thousand feet a minute. I can assure you uh, that it does not, and never has done. <laughs> in fact, if you get 700 feet a minute, that's about average. Um, however, the government also uh, were on a bit of an austerity campaign as well, and they uh, first of all, didn't make any decisions about uh, ratifying the RAF's uh, order for some considerable time, and then when they did, they ordered CAC to go slow so they didn't have to spend too much money too quickly. <laughs> <laughs> However, Fisherman's Bend went into production and they went fairly quickly once they got the go ahead. They had uh, seven uh, construction bays and uh, production went on. Uh, quite well for 62 aircraft. The uh, build, building of the aircraft, because it was only a small order of 62 aeroplanes, more on that later, um, they didn't go to any great uh, technical detail building tooling and jigging. However, there was still quite a lot of work. I think there was over 1,600 construction drawings, uh, uh, or pages of drawings, each with four drawings on it, so you did the math. Uh, here's another picture. Um, it's worth noting too for the few of you who may not have seen a windshield saying R, that uh, it's got a terrific um, access to the engine with uh, four petal uh, doors. And 1955, the first production aircraft finally flew. Uh, I apologise for the quality of the picture, but it's the only uh, historic shot I could get with it uh, just adjacent to Point Cook. Uh, the RAF took delivery of the aircraft in September and the last, last, last aircraft was rolled out of the CAC factory in August of uh, 57. Mm -hmm. However, for some reason or other, it didn't reach the RAAF until uh, the following year. And uh, uh, ironically, the last aircraft <laughs> delivered to the RAF was not the last aircraft rolled out. The last aircraft, as you would imagine, was number 62 to be rolled out. However, number 61 was the last one to be delivered. Here's uh, quite an interesting shot. Um, the first windjills were delivered to Euron Quinty, which is uh, about 10 miles uh, to southwest of Wagga. Um, that was one of the uh, basic flying training schools uh, uh, during the war, and the last one uh, to uh, retain that status. And initially, because there weren't a lo lot of windjills, you'll notice here the Wirraways in the background. Basic trainer, 60 hours on the wind heel. Advanced trainer and wings, 60 hours on the Wirraway. Another interesting picture of the time was uh, wind heel number one off the production line and the last two Tiger Moths in service at Point Cook. BFTS, uh, which was later renamed 1FTS, Flying Training School as against Basic Flying Training School, was relocated at Point Cook and it stayed there until uh, the RAF ceased their basic training. Now, some time later, um, and it was only 13 years later as you see, the RAF announced the all-through jet, the Mackie MB326H, and therefore the windjill was deemed to be going to retire. However, applause um, later, uh, but it rolled out a whole series of uh, interesting flights. Here's one with the Windjill, the uh, brand new Mackie, 
and the uh, vampire which was about to be replaced by the Maggie. And another one, uh, number 43, which you've seen that colour scheme before, uh, with two Mackies. Note, note the interesting attitude there. The windshield's probably doing about 120 knots, uh, which means it's uh, got climb power on, and the Mackies are uh, also doing 120 knots, and they're without flap, uh, not that far above the stall. Uh, sometime in my career, we actually formated two Mirages doing exactly the same thing, and you really see a difference in attitude there. <laughs> Okay, um, so with the uh, retirement of uh, the Wingeal forthcoming, a lot of the aircraft were placed into storage and all went to Wagga Wagga where the uh, technical training uh, was conducted and they joined the vampires uh, to be used as training aids by the uh, trainees. However, here comes the applause. The all through jet trainer wasn't. It didn't work. Um, the, interestingly enough, uh, number 35 course uh, had two guys on it who were trained um, on the Jet Provost, which was borrowed by the RAAF to test this theory. And it, it, they were so happy with it, they went ahead with this all through jet chain training program. However, when, when they got down to the bottom line, they discovered that uh, the training wasn't working as well as they'd hoped to. So, uh, number 69 pilots course in 1969 was the last one to uh, graduate on the uh, Vampire. And from then on, uh, there were a couple of courses that did through the all through jet training. And immediately after that, the Windshield came back in, not as a uh, basic trainer, but as a flight grading machine. And several courses, including uh, the one Ken, uh, uh, Ron Peters and myself were on. We did 15 hours flight grading on the Windjill. Not you? Oh, you, no, you, I was oh, you went to a different place. Yeah, I was you? one of the reasons they changed it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and after 15 hours flight grading, uh, the decimated uh, course rem remnants uh, were posted onto piers to uh, do the all through jet training. Subsequently, uh, they went back to doing approximately 60 hours Windjill and then. Uh, doing the remainder of their training at Pierce on the Mackie, and that seemed to work pretty well. Right, um, now in 1970, uh, four wind drills were converted for forward air control work. I don't know uh, how many of you know about forward air control, but basically it was brought about by the difficulty in fighter pilots in, uh, in jungle type terrain and uh, other close uh, combat uh, not being able to acquire the target. So a, a lighter aeroplane marked the target and also control the fighter aircraft who typically fly a wagon wheel pattern around uh, the, the marked target, which was marked by smoke of some description, either through rockets or grenades. And uh, the, the forward air controller would actually act like an air traffic controller and call the fighters in one at a time to the target, uh, make sure they were aimed at the right target and give them a, uh, a score as to how accurate they were. And it worked very well in Vietnam and uh, that's why the RAAF uh, decided they needed the capability. The Wingeal wasn't suitable for that role, but it worked reasonably well as a trainer. Um, here is an interesting photo of all four uh, forward air control Wingeals at the same time. There's very little difference. Uh, the main difference you can see in these photos are the um, whip antennas for uh, FM and also the rear antenna which was a combined UHF and uh, VHF antenna. So the, the aircraft had three radios. Later on we actually got four radios because I worked in this role as well and uh, the fourth radio was a secure voice radio to talk to the, uh, the army without uh, be, being compromised by the enemy listening in. Here's another shot which shows the biggest difference, and that's this little small smoke rack underneath the fuselage, which carries 12 smoke grenades. And they were used for the target marking. And uh, that photo was snapped by a, uh, one of the tradespeople when I was just saying hello to him. <laughs> um, 
Here's, here's another more recent picture. This uh, aircraft was until recently located in uh, Western Australia. And it's a bit hard to tell, but on that tail, it bears the insignia of number 76 squadron, because when number four flight, which originally uh, was the uh, uh, training and operational unit for forward air control, after it uh, became independent, um, 76 Squadron subsequently took over the forward air control uh, duties uh, because they were short of fighter pilots and they were then who were the forward air control pilots. And they subsequently used uh, various transport pilots um, as forward air controllers. <coughs> Sadly, uh, in short succession, two wind yields crashed, uh, killing four men. So uh, they lost their independence. And uh, we move on. 1975. That does echo, doesn't it? Um, the Windjill was finally replaced by the CT4 air trainer. However, that's what the history books say. Um, here's a picture of the plastic parrot. Um, it did last a little while, but um, not, not as long as expected. Um, in fact, in 1976, I looked at my logbook last week and my last instructional flight um, was in uh, September 1976 in a Windjill at Point Cook. So although the CD4 arrived in 1975, the Windjill still was operating because there were major problems with the CD4, including, including carbon monoxide poisoning, rudder pedals that fell off when they were pushed a bit hard, and uh, other minor issues like that. <laughs> Um, also, about that time, and uh, you'll have to forgive me if it's not exactly the right year, but uh, wind eels began to uh, have a new career as uh, warbirds, uh, as we, we know, ex-military aircraft by today. Several of them were purchased uh, from the, the aircraft that had been put in storage and subsequently started to appear on the civil register. And on June the 30th, 1995, the Windjill finally retired from the RWF after some uh, 40 years of service, which was an extremely long period of time. But it's not the end of the story by any means because, of course, those warbirds are now doing all sorts of things around the country and even overseas. Um, and a, a little bit more on that shortly. But uh, just before I move on, I'd like to point out some interesting things about uh, the Commonwealth Aircraft Corporation, they really tried very hard to sell their aircraft overseas and increase its market share in the civilian arena as well. And that went from the sublime to the ridiculous, as I'll show you. Um, they, uh, the RAF were also looking for a three-piece aircraft uh, about the same time. Um, but chose the Percival Prentice. It didn't last very long and subsequently they used the Percival Proctor, which entered service around about the end of 51. Um, the, this three-seater idea too, uh, the Windjill was a three-seater and the idea, a mad idea as somebody described it, was you could train two pilots at once, one in the front and one in the back. Um, and somehow it just didn't work and nobody really knows why. <laughs> Uh, there's the uh, Percival Proctor, and one would ask, um, is there some collusion here? Uh, I'm not sure who plagiarised who, uh, but the, the enormous similarities, particularly sliding cockpit, the uh, uh, tail dragger configuration and the tail forward of the um, um, elevators. Uh, another interesting thing about the wind in passing is because of the new location of the rudder, if you put full rudder on, the nose pitches down fairly violently if you're not expecting it because it blanks quite a lot of the elevator. COC also played what I've called paper aeroplanes, not the way we call it. Um, they came up with some paper versions that they tried to sell. The first one was fairly modest um, tricycle undercarriage, although that nose wheel probably wouldn't have gone very well on the bottom of the uh, cowling. <laughs> then they really got 
warmed up to the idea and uh, the next one was a uh, ambulance model where they widened the uh, right hand uh, access door and decided that they could put a stretcher in uh, as you see. Then they really got going. <laughs> this beautiful design <laughs> uh, was a crop duster uh, with a, as you can read down the bottom, uh, with a PT6 engine. There was the uh, jet trainer with the Rolls-Royce Dart and there was even a twin engine jet um, which you see uh, had both engines in the nose and I think this is a retractable undercarriage meant to be there. Yes, certainly the CAC uh, initially designed the windshield to be converted to a inwardly retracting main wheel should that be decided upon by the RAFIS to become a requirement. And the one that wasn't too far off the mark was the six-seater. Um, Ron Peters here has converted his to four, so two-thirds of the way there. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, mo moving on, uh, last month's meeting I invited you to look at two beautiful examples of the windshield and many of you took the opportunity to. Um, we'll, we'll look at those two airplanes again in just a little bit more detail uh, because uh, Ron and uh, Lynn who own them uh, were expecting to put on a uh, small presentation so I'm just including that in my talk as well. First of all, uh, 423, owned and restored by Lynn Forster. 407, also known as 443 because of its colour scheme, uh, is owned and enhanced by George Bowmanis and Ron Peters. Uh, there they were last week in front of the flight line. Okay, first of all, uh, to uh, Lynn's beautiful aeroplane. Uh, Lynn and Di, his lovely wife, purchased the aircraft uh, from Bob Eastgate uh, and then uh, had to transport it all the way across to York where um, Lynn did his uh, restoration work. They spent 10 years and I believe that's now the right figure, it wasn't really 14, is that Lynn? That's correct. Um, and rebuilt it from the ground up, uh, absolutely magnificent job. Uh, the aircraft had its first flight in April this year and it just performed beautifully, everything was better than any airplane, any windshield I've ever flown. Uh, it's stunning presentation. And uh, there it is in flight. There's Lynn uh, contemplating what to do next. The engine bay, as you can see, everything's just immaculate. The instruments and avionics, uh, they're looking at the original cockpit, uh, you can see it's probably pretty standard for uh, its uh, period in history. One thing that is worth noting, this box here is a control box for a radio that's uh, probably about half the all-up weight of a Cessna 152 and it contained 10 channels which were crystallised so there's no frequency agility. Um, we used to fly the FAC windshields from uh, Williamtown in New South Wales up to Townsville to do uh, uh, operational work with the Army and we used to have to take a radio technician with us and when we stopped for our overnight at um, the Gold Coast we had to stop there of course um, the, the uh, radio fitter would change the crystals so that we had enough frequencies to do the second half of the trip and then the same in reverse <laughs> um, so if you now look at the current instrument panel Lynn's gone to great lengths to try and preserve as much of the original uh, as possible and still provide the functionality of uh, a, a modern radio. So, the original installation, uh, sorry, the new installation, and a Garmin uh, intercom system, a combined uh, um, GPS and communication, uh, i.e. radio, uh, as a second radio, a transponder, and all the original elect electrical switches, albeit slightly rearranged, including the original uh, Bakelite ground flight switch. Really look, looks nice. Um, the, the old adage when you're working on it, and uh, we picked up Lynn a couple of years ago, he was 90% there, 90% to go. <laughs> <laughs> but, as I said, she flew beautifully. 
Um, and it did, wasn't long before she was doing what Wingeals loved doing. Uh, shortly after uh, being exhibited on the tarmac, uh, JD tried his hand at formation aerobatics, and I'm not sure whose eyes were bulging the most, <laughs> his or mine. <laughs> well done, Lynn. Yeah. Credit to you. <laughs> and the second aeroplane, not to be outdone, um, Ron Peterson and George Bowmanis, uh, they uh, own uh, 407 which is painted in another aeroplane colour scheme. You'll have to get them to explain that bit. <laughs> they purchased the aeroplane uh, from uh, Tony Alder it, way back in 2000. Um, and uh, here, here's their rationale they used on their respective wives as to why they should buy it. Uh, it goes something like this. Uh, both of the guys who are on number 73 pilot's course in Point Cook in uh, 1969 and uh, they were doing that flight rating which I spoke about earlier and they, before going on to um, jet training, uh, they flew in that aeroplane so therefore they had to buy it. Um, they, they joke about, this is not mine, this is Ron's story here, um, they never went solo in those days, it took them another 31 years to go solo in that <laughs> so they reckon they were slow learners. <laughs> But in fact, uh, to, be, to straight, put the story in true perspective, going solo wasn't part of the syllabus of the flight grading scheme. Um, when the aircraft became available, of course, they just had to have it. It was meant to be, or so they told their wives. Now, I've got a bit of a... a George and Ron uh, have been good friends many years, and uh, here they are together. Um, in uh, Point Cook. Uh, however, George's presence is seen by the shadow of the photographer. <laughs> and you wouldn't recognise Ron today. <laughs> now, the problem I have, notice the, the name of this aeroplane? 43. Remember which aeroplane they bought? Don't tell their wives. <laughs> okay, now, not to be outdone, uh, by Lynn, uh, they decided that uh, they would do some enhancements as well. So, um, major maintenance wise, uh, the uh, wings and tail plane were removed, x rayed, life of type extension was uh, carried out. They had um, uh, aileron tubes uh, were non destructive inspected. Uh, they had two new engines, uh, however, just to, in case you're a bit curious, they were one at a time. <laughs> um, had Bosch magnetos fitted, uh, a, a no time prop fitted. They uh, got a new wheel and brake assembly, uh, cartridge uh, scavenger filter, a uh, primer pump for the oil uh, to uh, lubricate it prior to start, and uh, they did a major uh, rewire of the aircraft. You'll see why they did a major rewire in a moment. Uh, they also uh, got a new carving. Avionics fitment, this is why they had to rewire the aeroplane. Um, first of all, a Dynon uh, uh, electronic flight instrument display engine management system uh, with full uh, digital flight data recording at one second intervals. Uh, they had all nine cylinders uh, with sensors on them for uh, various temperatures and pressures. So every second there's heaps of data, including a whole bunch of other stuff that I, I have no idea what it's all about, but Ron will tell you. Um, they've got a Garmin intercom and a GPS. Garmin's did pretty well out of this, obviously, as you can see. Uh, they got the Garmin Navcom, um, Bendix King Com 2 and Transponder, a, a beautiful little digital fuel flow meter which uh, feeds into their EFIS. Uh, and an ELB, um, which most people do have anyway, but they don't have all the rest of that stuff. Uh, their engine was also very similar to um, Lynn's, just a beautiful piece of equipment. Uh, as you can see, there's a lot of chrome there. The uh, instrument panel that I showed you earlier was the original one, had been somewhat doctored by uh, a previous owner when they uh, first saw Winry Aviation. And you can see uh, the centre section there as the uh, 
Cessna type uh, panel. That all changed. The uh, Where do I start? <laughs> um, basically what this slide's showing is that the uh, Dynon system there will fill uh, your head with uh, all sorts of information, including uh, full instrument uh, landing system approach if you want it, uh, and any other kind of uh, um, uh, data you want, down, uh, on, on this particular screen, of which there are quite a number, you've got all your engine management issues, you can see various temperatures and uh, stuff for the engine. That interfaces with the GPS, so you get full crosstalk between the two, and additionally, just in the corner here is the shade and um, fuel flow meter, so Ron can uh, go cruising along and decide that he wants to go way past his original um, destination, in real time he can just look up here and he can see how far he could go and how long it would take him at his current power set. It's just a brilliant piece of kit and very well in, in, uh, incorporated by Ron. And the technology comparison, the stuff on the left there is replaced by that little box there plus a hell of a lot more. However, that uh, program came to an end and finally um, Ron and George are back in the air enjoying the fruits of their labour. Here's by wind farm at Walkaway, not far from Geraldton, on a trip to Calbarry. Um, there, there's me having a bit of um, um, sun block at Busselton. It flew at the Cunderton Air Show, and uh, I think they did a fantastic job on the aeroplane too. So I've taken you basically from 1948 right through to the present, and the story's not ended, of course. Uh, these warbirds will be flying for, for a long time to come. Um, I'm not sure where this picture came from. Owning a windshield apparently has fringe benefits for some. <laughs> but uh, I, I can't guarantee that. It's a bird on the wing. Yeah, yeah for those who can't see. Yeah. There's a young lady throwing herself at the aeroplane. Are there any questions? Yes. What did yes. this cost? Dennis, uh, were any of them ever fitted with a seven cylinder? No, the, 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 the engine was never put into uh, an airplane. In fact, they were also looking at the right whirlwind as a, an option in the early days, but neither the prototypes nor the, the uh, production aircraft flew with anything except the uh, R9F5. So what, what was the cost of this total? project, Ron's project. Oh, you have to talk Ooh. to Ron about yeah. that. And, that uh, is why. I, I, you know, there are certain secrets us men yeah. you know, I like to keep. <laughs> <laughs>